our next speaker. Um, there will be two more talks before the coffee, actually not coffee, juice break. So our next speaker is, uh, if I dare, uh, it's, he's our Spider-Man. So it's kind of a joke, but it's true. So first he specializes in arachnology, so he loves spiders. And he's also kind of a hero because you saved my life in Paris last oh. year. <laughs> and this is also um, a good reason to invite you. So. I hope it's not the only one. No, definitely <laughs> not. That's definitely not. So I would like also to say that you are head of the Department of Ecology at Brandenburg uh, University of Technology in Germany. Uh, you are associate professor. You were associate professor in Lund University in Sweden before, and so you have uh, an expertise that uh, is about the relationship between uh, human uh, activities and disturbances on land use and climate change and biodiversity conservation. So I think it's uh, time to give you the floor and let you explain what you do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Caroline. Thank you also for having me, you and uh, your co-organizers and the whole team. It's really a great pleasure to be here today. It's a fantastic uh, event so far. I'm now a bit stressed out because if I take my full time slot, you will have 15 minutes less for the coffee or juice breaks. So please don't blame it on me. Blame it on Thea. <laughs> It's also um, quite hard to uh, present a talk about diversity in agricultural landscapes following Thea because he gave this very nice comprehensive overview and he said it all. Fortunately enough, I had a bright moment when I wrote up my title and submitted it and I squeezed in this uh, term, functional, into the whole title. So it is about functional diversity. And I will have the pleasure to tell you now in the next 30, 40 minutes um, what I mean by that and what this concept is actually about. And it deviates from the diversity aspects we have heard about before. So it's not so much about taxonomic diversity in that sense. I'm also quite happy about the uh, previous presentations and the ongoing discussions and questions because we have heard multiple times this morning from Mark Urban and by a comment by Dries Ponte, but also now in the talk by Thea about traits and about properties that species possess. So this is really pretty much about all that jazz. And it is about spiders to some extent, but also about all these other fantastic creatures. So anything six plus legs is really my part of the planet. I hope nobody here is arachnophobic, okay? So let's get started. I show you two slides about taxonomic patterns, I think, in the beginning. Now this is another paper. This is not the Halman paper from 2017 and PLOS One. This is a more recent one on the global insect decline. Uh, you can see here for different groups of insects and also for the total biomass, the annual rate of decline in species numbers assumed based on that paper here. You can also see those authors were much braver than Halman and colleagues in the previous paper in trying to formulate the causes and drivers. They created this pie chart and uh, said that, for example, intensive agriculture contributes 23.9% to the overall decline in insect diversity worldwide. And then other factors are less severe drivers but most of them, and many of them I will also address in my talk, are more or less related to land use intensification, land use conversation, con conversation like deforestation, afforestation, or turning permanent grasslands into arable fields. Um, fortunately enough, because you can ask me questions afterwards anyway about those studies, but I immediately show you the echo that this paper created. as a series of publications from colleagues in different journals that scrutinized that paper. So I'm not saying that what I showed you in the previous slide is, is the full truth. There's a lot of very credible colleagues that have good reasons to criticize this paper. Nevertheless, I think that's also a kind of a summary of the previous presentations and what you probably know, it's absolutely undisputable that there's a decline in diversity, that insects and also maybe spiders, we know actually quite little about them, are a part of that story. Just think about the numbers we heard here already today. One out of eight million species are close to extinction. Um, in insects, the special case is that what we talk about right now is only about 20% of what we know. 80% of the insect species are undescribed and unknown. That's the most current estimate. So we 
might even lose a lot of species before we even know they are there. Okay, so keep that in mind. That's a very special trait of invertebrates, I would, I would say. And I also want to show you this slide here, which is from a paper about contributions of insects to ecosystem services that then link to the UN sustainability goals. And it's pretty evident that if you just go through here, pollination we heard about, predators and biocontrol, I will also talk about organic matter decomposition, nutrient cycles, human food. And then it's quite embarrassing. Those authors put a spider into an insect and ecosystem service paper. I don't know, but they probably had a bad day. Uh, of course, there's also a dark side to insect diversity. We have crop pests, disease vectors, but this nicely illustrates the purpose and the function that uh, those critters perform for human society. Um, now, that was it about taxonomic diversity. I'm really I'm um, glad that I didn't put anything else in here because, as I said before, Taya said it before, sorry, I'm always lowering this. So we are moving on to functional diversity now. Even as a young PhD student, I scratched my head and I asked my supervisor, why would I relate species numbers to decomposition function values or to biocontrol values or pollination values? We all know from our first population ecology, community ecology class that we have a few dominant species, and then we have this long tail of very rare species in most communities. It's really a very common pattern. So why is the number of species in a local community logically connected to the functions that this community performs at a given point in time? Right? This, this should start the thought process in you. And my immediate idea, uh, triggered by some really nice papers, was, hmm, isn't it much more important what functional properties those individual species carry and what particular functions are present with a high dominance amongst all the species in the local community? And that's exactly the functional diversity approach. So if you look at the textbook definition, um, functional traits can be morphological, biochemical, physiological, structural, phenological properties of given species. And uh, you then separate those functional traits into so-called response traits. Those are traits, properties of species that are particularly sensitive to disturbance. Uh, and effect traits, those are traits that um, affect the performance of a community in which that species is a part of it. And now if you look at some of the groups we study intensively, I'll give you some examples. In ground beetles, you have species that are almost strictly granivorous. So they exclusively feed on plant seeds. And then you have some omnivorous ground beetle species who prefer to feed both on seeds and on live prey. They are more opportunistic feeders. And then you have some almost strictly carnivorous ground beetles. So here, within the taxonomic group of the ground beetles, you have very different trophic groups, and each species is having, showing some expression of this trait to some extent. Body size, of course, in a spider community, you have small spider species, you have large spider species, you have species of intermediate size. A lot of these body size ideas and traits are connected to physiological properties. And uh, mobility, we talked about dispersal, true bugs. You have some true bug species that are brachypterous at adult, as adults. They can't fly. They only disperse by walking around. But you also have species that are macropterous. They have fully developed wings and they fly. And that extends their range dramatically, of course. So when you look at a whole community, not looking at just counting the number of species, but assigning traits to all those species and then looking at the presence and dominance of certain traits might actually create a much better mechanistic links, link to why our communities respond to certain land use pressures and also how this relates to the functions they perform. And that's the idea of my presentation, illustrated here. Um, you have land use change and intensity change, intensification. These are the two drivers I will address today. These have a certain effect on the function diversity and functional trait composition of the invertebrate communities. And this, in essence, can link to ecosystem services. 
And now, um, before anyone asks me that question, um, this is a spider, an orb weaver feeding on an insect. And spiders are important biocontrol agents in agriculture and forestry. And just to convince you right from the start, I would like to know from you, what is your estimate? How much prey biomass does the annual global spider community kill in tons? Okay, I'll give you a number. Humans, us, we consume roughly about 400 million tons meat and fish each year. 400 million tons. So we make a vote count. Who of you thinks that spiders worldwide, the prey they kill is less than that 400 million tons? Hands up. Okay, I'm now doing the other one because I want to see how many of you have no opinion whatsoever or, or have already fallen asleep. How, uh, how, how many of you think that it's more than those 400 million tons? Yay, all right. So we estimated this and published a paper two years ago, a colleague Martin Niffler and me from Basel, it's between 400 and 800 million tons. That is the amount of mainly insect prey that the global spider community kills in a given year. So this impact, this function is dramatic. They are really top predators. So uh, no critical questions towards the biocontrol function of spiders, okay, in the end. And of course, these functions they perform have an impact on society. If an ecosystem function has an impact on society, a benefit for society, it becomes an ecosystem service. Okay? All right, so let's get into um, the case studies. And we start with this idea of response traits. So how does land use intensification, land use conversion, affect certain traits in those communities? Not, not necessarily species richness, but the presence of certain traits. For that, I take you to central Germany, um, three study regions in which we had data for um, ground beetle communities, spider communities, and true bug communities in total 350 species. For all of those species, we coded 12 to 15 traits. That's a lot of work. Um, and we had this data from um, forest, grassland, and arable fields, three land use systems that are often converted into each other, and from high or low intensity managed sites in each of these three land use classes. So how does this affect the functional diversity of those communities? And of course, the case organism group I picked to show you are spiders. Here you see spiders and you see something that is called functional distinctness. The higher the functional distinctness of, of a local community is, the more different traits weighted by the abundance of the individuals showing those properties this community has. Okay, the wider the, the, the range of traits is. So what we see is when we look at the three land use types, forest, grassland, and arable field, that if you move from forests into grasslands and arable fields, the functional distinctness, the functional diversity of our spider communities is dramatically declining. Okay? If you look at the axis values here, it's a real considerable decline in functional diversity. So conversion of forest systems into arable fields will lead to a dramatic decline for the local trade pool in that landscape. Um, but what we also see is when we look at the intensity gradient within each of these land use types, so from high management intensity to low, we can see that we have a decline in functional diversity or, di or distinctness, I should say, in grassland and forest systems. So here, management intensification within the land use type, local intensification, leads to a further decline of functional diversity. Not so in arable fields. And our explanation is, functional diversity in arable fields is already so low compared to the other systems, there's no further decline by intensifying management locally in that system. But it's not just this. This is an index. This is like Shannon, Simpson, whatever. I hate indices. I think they don't do anything good for us. Well, that's probably a bit too strong statement, but I really don't like them. Let's look into the trait composition and the effect that trait composition 
uh, sorry, that these land use types have on trade composition. Spiders again, of course. This is an NMDS. I don't torture you with any ordination approaches. What you have to know is all those triangles here are forest plots. These are arable fields. These are grasslands. And we just related the trade composition of each of those plots for spider communities and then superimposed vectors for the individual trade categories. And what we can see is in forest systems, our spider communities are much more dominated by species with a low dispersal capability, by sheet web weavers, also to some extent by rather large spider species compared to arable fields, uh, which are more dominated by smaller species. We also see that those two open land use types, arable fields and grasslands, are more dominated by species with high dispersal capability and who are active ground running spiders. And this now makes an interesting link because by converting one of these land use types into another, you will change the trade composition of spider communities in that landscape. You will change it according to that. And this will have functional consequences. And we do not yet know what functional consequences it will have if we suddenly convert some forest into arable land and we lose those low dispersal species. We do not know this yet. We are still working on this. But we already know from other studies that biotic interactions, which Mark Urban also mentioned this morning, so trophic interactions, differ drastically between predators and their prey. Again, spiders. So you have spider species up here and you have prey orders down here. And these are meta webs, meta food webs of the diet composition of those spider species in all three land use types I showed you, arable fields, grasslands, and forests. And I don't go much into detail. These are just some of the bipartite network matrices you can calculate from those meta webs. And you can see there's a difference. So whatever we do with our landscapes does not just have consequences for species richness. We also promote or knock out certain traits, and that will eventually directly link to functional changes. Um, same is true within. Um, land use types. The next graph is again four ordination plots. I'm not going into detail. This is just spider species in arable fields. And we have sets of spider species that predominantly prey on hymenopterans, bees, wasps, and ants. We also have sets of spider species that predominantly prey on aphids. So if you are a farmer and you have an aphid problem and it shows up again and again, you probably want to do something to promote those guys and not necessarily those guys or those guys, okay? So all these responses are directly linked to um, functional roles of the species as entities with certain properties. Okay, um, one more study for the response trait and then I move on to functions a bit more. It's another study in the German Biodiversity Exploratories where we now had a for much larger range of species from larger range of, range of above ground and below ground invertebrates, 800, more than 800 species. We again coded the traits for all of them, large trait matrix. And we looked into forest and grassland plots of an, a gradient of management intensities from very extensively managed to intensively managed plots. And the surprising fact and result from this study was that depending on the taxonomic group you focus on, the trait responses to management intensity or land use differences really differs. Here is shown for, for cicadas and centipedes, two ecologically very distinct groups by any means. If any one of you can, meet, can tell me more than two traits that they have in common, I'm, I'm really impressed. So they share a similar response. Their functional diversity, labeled here as trait diversity, was higher in, in the forest communities than in the grassland communities. But Ground beetles showed the opposite pattern. Grass, ground beetles act, actually had a very low functional diversity in the forest systems, based on all the traits we coded for them. And when you then look into detail, what are the individual traits? So again, trait composition that respond to that. You can see that, to some extent, body size is a major player to affect this overall diversity response. We had, on average, larger ground beetle species in forest systems than in grassland systems. But for true bugs and centipedes, it was just the opposite pattern. 
So it's not that straightforward always. It's sometimes very conflicting and tricky. And what happens with land use intensification within those land use types? Here you see for the proportion of low mobility species that with increasing land use intensity, spiders both in forest and grassland systems had a decrease in the proportion of species with low mobility. So more intensively managed forests and grasslands had a larger share of low mobility species and a higher share of high mobility species. And that's what ecological theory predicts. Higher disturbance, higher capacity to be able to disperse. But once again, strange patterns, strong patterns for Truvox, for example, where this is just the opposite pattern. So we are really just at the at the times now of learning these, these more trait-related response patterns, especially in insect and spider communities, in my opinion. And again, here the link to function. This will matter, this dispersal ability. It's a bit of a redundant slide because Mark already talked about it. But we have a range of dispersal capabilities across taxonomic groups. And how mobile they are strongly connects to how they respond to spatial heterogeneity and at what scale they respond to spatial heterogeneity. And in an agricultural context, that directly links to the questions that Thea Chanka nicely addressed. What is the spillover capacity of communities from semi-natural habitats into arable fields? Because if our pollinators are our natural enemies of pests, do not move from the semi-natural habitat into the crop fields, they don't do any good for us, they don't provide any ecosystem services, if they like their flower strip, if they like their grassy margin too much, map, no ecosystem service, okay? And we have to keep in mind that dispersal and mobility is a major driver behind these spillover patterns. So this sums it up to some extent for the response part. Um, it's, uh, you have to keep in mind that land use changes in terms of conversion of different land use types will have dramatic consequences for trade composition. <laughs> Um, the local management has additional potential, but not very predictable so far. We don't really know in what direction it necessarily goes, apart from the fact that higher intensity usually triggers for smaller individuals and smaller species. For many other traits, we don't know yet what the responses are. So which traits are then important for arthropod-mediated ecosystem services? And I will spend the remainder of my time uh, to do that. Um, Going to conventional and organic farming, of course, I've also done research in conventional versus organic farming. And we, for example, see a, often a common pattern amongst the group of uh, taxonomic groups of spiders and beetles, especially in beetles, of course, we see a higher proportion of carnivorous individuals in organically managed fields than in conventionally managed fields. We also have some conflicting evidence for this, but does that really translate into any higher pest control service which we would like to have from this under organic farming. Remember, organic farmers cannot apply insecticides, so they need to rely on these natural regulatory services. So let's look at that and move away from those nasty beetles to spiders. Um, web building spiders in conventional cereal fields recently transferred young organic fields and old established organic fields. And you can see here with the gray bars, that's just the number of aphids on average found in these different management types, replicated fields of different management and age. And the means are the interesting thing now. The means show you the area-based number of aphids realized as prey in spider webs in those fields. So what you see for the aphids is the organic systems didn't have more Aphid infest, higher aphid infestation than the conventional ones. Aphid numbers are fairly comparable, but web building spiders did a much better job in killing and taking aphids out of the system under these organic practices. And for cicadas, it's not as clear, but at least for the young organic fields, it seems to be a pattern that mirrors the one for aphids. And now the question is, of course, yes, yeah, so what? And in the same study, this is the same data, the fewer aphids your field, sorry, the more aphids your field has, the lower your yield is. So we found a, there's a lot of scatter 
but still we found a negative relationship. So more aphids mean reduced yield, okay? So for the farmer, having a management component that promotes aphid predation could be utilized to directly work on higher yields. Nice. Um, landscape, another study. One species, not a community now. And this is addressing something important. This is now not a community-wide trait diversity or trait composition study, but it's focusing on this one study, uh, species, sorry, Harpalus affinis. We collected Harpalus affinis of fields that were located, cereal fields again, either in landscapes dominated by conventional fields in the surrounding or from landscapes that had a much higher share of organically managed fields in the landscape. Okay? And what we found is that on average the individuals from the fields with the surrounding of organic fields were larger. This is a morphometric trait, body size. We measured this in individuals. Okay? So then we took beetles from these different settings along the size gradient and performed a cafeteria experiment in the lab where we fed them wheat seeds to see if larger beetles also have a higher feeding frequency on these arable wheat seeds. And it's beautiful. They do. Okay? So if your field is an Im embedded in a landscape that has a higher share of organic farming and your beetles in your field are bigger, you might have a direct benefit for the wheat control service that those larger individuals actually perform. Okay? Nice. Again, promising. But it's really the start of understanding these things. And finally, as the last study, a cage experiment where we move from wheat pests to actually animal pests. Um, and here we performed a cage experiment in southern Sweden where we looked into cages. We included standardized numbers of aphids. And we looked just at how good uh, our natural enemy community would consume these aphids here. So the higher the predation rate, the more aphids were consumed. And we can see that the community-weighted mean predator body size of our predator communities, that is an overall community measure of the average body size of the natural enemies, the higher, the larger the predators were in those local communities, the lower aphid predation rates were. So communities of larger natural enemy species had lower predation rates on aphids. And that was puzzling. And Adrian Rush, the main author here, and me and other colleagues, we sat together and we started discussing this. We looked at different aspects of the data. And here's our very clever, actually it was Adrian who had the idea, Adrian's very clever explanation. This is from a cage, from one cage, where predation rate on aphids was pretty low. That's a pretty low value. And this is the size distribution of all the spiders in black and all the ground beetles. And what you see here is you have a peak of, of spiders at sizes of 3 to 4 millimeters. These were the dominant spiders in our cages. And you have a peak of fairly large ground beetle species, but not so many small ground beetle species. And our idea why under such a setting aphid predation is so low is the large carabids, those bloody bastards, killed our spiders. And they do. We have very good evidence from molecular gut content studies that carabids are amongst the most severe spider killers in temperate arable fields. So let's do something against them. No, I like carabids too. But what then in the, how then in the, in the cages with large predation rates? Look at the body size distribution. This is real data. So more than twice as efficient in controlling aphids. And this peak here of the large carabids is in that cage is much smaller than that peak here. And we have a much higher peak of small carabid beetles who would probably not take the risk to attack an equal size spider because, you know, they are predators, they are intra predators, many of them are cannibalistic. They assess risk, maybe not in the same complex way as a lion or a, le a leopard would do, but they assess risk. So here we think we have higher aphid predation rates because we have much lower intra predation between large carabids and small spiders, and therefore they do their job and they focus on the alternative, the aphid prey.
All right, deep breath. To wrap it up, when we bring this idea about response traits, and I showed you body size, I showed you mobility, dispersal ability, where we looked at, at body size again. Uh, when we bring this together, um, body size to me is the most promising one, but body size is also very problematic because it's an aggregate of many possible things that can be behind it. It can be physiological aspects, it can be morphological aspects, um, but we also find traces that other trait components like dispersal ability strongly reply and respond to land use change and land use intensification. We, what we need to understand next is how all those traits and changes in traits and composition in communities link to ecosystem functions and services. And then, ideally, at some point, we will be able to develop a predictive framework that tells us what can we do to optimize the provision of ecosystem services based on this more mechanistic link between disturbance, trait, and function. And I just want to confirm what was said before. I strongly think that a multifunctional landscape approach is the key to all that, at which we consider different scales. To me, the key word here is heterogeneity. You can also call it complexity, in my opinion. And, uh, but I also want to raise the fact, you've seen some pictures here about mites and, and small animals. And what I said this morning, for many of those organisms, a square meter is a continent. Okay, and we need to keep that in mind. So we need to consider all scales. A bit more outlook, two, two or three more slides. For the Harpalus affinis study with the body size range within that species, I strongly think we need to go even deeper for analyzing trait variation within species, between individuals. So not across communities for all the species, but within species. But that is a lot of work. This is showing you for the six spider species, the diet in different habitats. This guy here, no matter if you catch him in an arable field or grassland, he will always predominantly prey on flies. But this guy here has a completely different preference preying on, on mainly humanopterans in grasslands, but in forests, mainly on flies. And please ask me, aren't web building spiders just filter feeders? Please ask me that question at the end of the talk. Uh, okay, um, indicator species. We published a paper on indicator species for ecosystem service provision. What about indicator traits? Much cooler. I just told you I don't believe too much into the direct link between species numbers in a community and the function that community performs. I know there's ample evidence in science and nature that these relationships exist. I still struggle with really understanding why that should be. So why, why don't we just link the presence and dominance of certain properties, functional traits in communities with the levels of ecosystem services and functions to better understand them, work in progress. And then everything is everything. Um, trade-offs and synergies between ecosystem services and biodiversity. That's something where we really get into this multi-diversity, multifunctionality discussion. We need a good word for multi-traitism, multi trait you, you can come up, up with a suggestion. We need to add that trait idea to this to make it really much more precise in a sense of, I think Mark used that word, natural history. It's almost like a curse word nowadays. You always avoid it almost because it sounds so old-fashioned. But all these traits are about natural history and we need to work with that. So we are even brave enough in a recently funded project to link these functional diversity changes in archipel communities of arable lands to human and livestock health. That's the next step. So that's, uh, we have a good idea how to, we haven't started yet, so we might run into multiple problems, but we have very large databases on communities, on their traits, how they change with land use, and then we also have data on, for example, how palatable fodder grass from permanent grasslands is in different locations where we also have this other data. So we want to link this and we want to see does a high herbivore pressure of large herbivore species lead to a, a reduced palatability of those grass that is harvested from these fields. That's the next step. I thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to answer any question. Thank you.
Thank you so much for this inspiring talk. I think it complements really nicely the talk of Teja. Would you have questions? And please, non-biologists, you're welcome to say it's not clear. <laughs>